Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. On June 8, 1908, an unmarried immigrant nurse named Sarah Coton finally had enough. After she lured the doctor that she worked for to an abandoned house, she shot and killed him. Never once did she believe her actions were wrong. In the investigation that followed, it was discovered that her boss, Dr. Martin Ospitz, had raped her at work and she had become pregnant. When the police and courts refused to help her, she took matters into her own hands and carried out a sentence of death. Sarah's story became a national sensation. The press portrayed her as a powerless woman who had no other choice than to shoot her attacker. But Sarah saw things differently. She was an avenger who killed her attacker before he could hurt other women. When I thought of my broken life and the lives he might break, well, I felt it was my duty to kill him she told a reporter. But Sarah was soon on trial for her life. What would the courts decide? I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. In 1907, Sarah Coton was working at a sanitarium in New York City. Like many staff members of the day, she also lived at the hospital. She was training to be a nurse under Dr. Martin Ospitz. He was bullying, aggressive, and threatening to her, but Sarah was determined to stick it out. Dr. Ospitz promised her that she would become a trained nurse if she stayed in his employ. I was frightened and did not want to stay, she later explained, but the doctor wanted me to stay. One morning, Ospitz broke into Sarah's room. He chloroformed her, and while she was unconscious, he raped her. The rape resulted in a pregnancy. When he found out that Sarah was pregnant, the doctor pressured her to have an abortion. Sarah refused and quit her job, but struggled to find new work. She had immigrated from Russia in 1902, and now she was an unmarried, pregnant woman with no means to support herself. In 1908, she took Ospitz to court. She brought a suit charging him with rape and demanding financial support for the unborn child. Ospitz denied the accusation and used his brother and brother-in-law to attack Sarah's reputation. They claimed she had a poor character implying that she had seduced Ospitz and initiated a sexual relationship with him. The judge ruled in favor of the doctor and dismissed the case. Sarah then went to the police for help, but they turned her away. She then visited the district attorney, who told her that there was no legal recourse that could be taken against Sarah's rapist. That's when Sarah decided to, quote, be my own judge, unquote. On June 8, 
she lured her rapist to the home of a pretend patient. When Ospitz arrived, she shot him through the heart. She didn't protest when the police took her away. Never did she proclaim her innocence. She simply stated that her actions had been justified. She had done it to protect other women. She was correct, at least as far as that went. Sarah had not been Ospitz's only victim. It was later discovered that Ospitz had a history of wronging women. Before Sarah killed him, at least two other women brought complaints against the doctor. One woman, Agnes Deffa, tried to attack Ospitz in court when he claimed that she had initiated a sexual relationship with him. The other woman, Anna Jensen, had been a patient at Ospitz's sanitarium. After Ospitz raped her, she burst into his office with a gun. She tried to shoot him, but the cartridge in her revolver failed to fire. This attempted murder happened only a few months before Ospitz raped Sarah. The police had been aware of the incident and yet still did nothing to help Sarah when she lodged her complaint against the doctor. As Sarah waited in prison for her trial, her case became a media sensation. At first, the stories were negative. She was called wretched, a frenzied girl, and a total wreck. The stories painted a picture of hysteria and criminality, an immigrant who was naturally a vicious killer. But all that changed after she gave birth to her son, Abraham, in prison. The newspaper now told a new story of a woman who must be innocent. Abraham was the proof of her story. The evil doctor had tried to pressure her to abort the baby, and Sarah's refusal made her popular with the public. She was a model mother, they said, who was only defending her honor. Reporters compared her case to the unwritten law that applied to gentlemen in the 19th century. If a woman's honor was at stake, gentlemen were allowed to retaliate, even if it violated the law. By the turn of the 20th century, that same law began to apply to women themselves. Women had little power to stop men's aggression and violence, the unwritten law argued, so it was acceptable for women to protect themselves in any way they could, even with a gun. At the end of Sarah's trial, Judge James A. Blanchard accepted her plea of insanity. He gave her a suspended sentence, sending her to care for the Council of Jewish Women. Sarah's defense inspired other women. In early 1909, a woman named Elizabeth coerced Charles Schmidt into marrying her, saying if he didn't, she would blow out his brains like Sarah Coton did. Sarah Comiskey attempted to kill her father for abandoning his family. Nellie Walden killed her ex-boyfriend for running off. These women claimed they were inspired to violence because of Sarah Coton. As for Sarah herself, she walked out of prison after her trial and vanished from history. The Council for Jewish Women helped her to find a suitable home where she might change her name and rear her child in ignorance of the crime its mother had committed. The Council concluded its statement on Sarah's case with this, while no one can consistently condone murder or any other offense against the law, it is gratifying to know that this suffering woman is not to be cast into prison for a crime that she primarily was not to blame for. Born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1937, Grady Stiles Jr., also known as Lobster Boy, led an interesting life and suffered a death that was just as intriguing. Grady was born with a rare medical condition known to run in his family called ectrodactyly. More commonly known as Lobster Claw Syndrome, ectrodactyly is a condition in which the middle fingers are missing and the fingers on either side of where they should be are fused together. The result is that the hands look like lobster claws. The feet are also sometimes affected, as was the case with Grady. Grady's father also suffered from the condition and toured the country in sideshows as the Lobster Man. He wasted no time introducing Grady to show life 
billing him as the Lobster Boy and starting him in the freak show business at the tender age of seven. Greedy Styles was an instant hit on the carnival scene and grew up to be quite strong. Though he could not walk, he pushed himself around in a wheelchair and learned to crawl on his limbs, which led to him developing incredible upper body strength. While working the carnival circuit, Lobster Boy met a young woman named Mary Teresa. Though she did not suffer from any mutations, she ran away to join the carnival at the age of 19 and fell in love with Grady. The two married and had several children together, two of which inherited Gray's ectrodactyly. For a while, they toured as the Lobster family, but life turned ugly when Grady began drinking. Reputed to be a mean drunk, Lobster Boy reportedly beat his wife and children for years until one night in 1973. On that night, Grady fought with Mary, threw her to the ground, and ripped her IUD out of her body with his bare hands. She promptly divorced him. Grady Stiles eventually remarried, though his second wife, too, divorced him. Though still a mean drunk, Grady Stiles lived a relatively quiet life until 1978. At that point, he thrust himself into the spotlight again. When his eldest daughter fell in love with a man Grady did not approve of, he killed her would-be groom with a shotgun the day before the wedding. There was no doubt about Grady's guilt as he freely confessed to the crime, but he never served time for the crime. Though he was found guilty in 1979, Grady's life of alcoholism and cigarette smoking had taken a toll. He had cirrhosis of the liver and emphysema in addition to his ectrodactyly. Therefore, it was determined he would not receive adequate medical care in prison. Although he was a convicted murderer now, Grady was sentenced to only 15 years probation. Escaping prison made Lobster Boy cocky, and he reportedly told others he could kill them and get away with it since he already had. The verdict had a large impact on Grady's first wife, Mary, who inexplicably remarried him in 1989. His ill-tempered drinking, coupled with a feeling of invincibility from getting away with murder, made Grady even more abusive than he was before. In 1992, Mary decided she had had enough of Grady's abuse. She paid her friend and neighbor, Chris Wyant, $1,500 to kill her husband. Wyant committed the murder, shooting Grady in the head while he watched television in his Florida home. Like Grady Stiles, Wyant went to court for the murder and was found guilty. Unlike Grady Stiles, Wyant was sentenced to 27 years in prison for the murder. Mary also stood trial and received a sentence of 12 years in prison. And the Lobster Boy? In death, his reviews have been mixed. Some in the carnival community confirm that he was an ill-tempered man and even go so far as to compare him to Satan. Others revere him as a smart businessman who went from appearing in sideshows to owning sideshows. These people contend that Mary should simply have walked away. Perhaps the final verdict lies with his children. Several of them admit that shedding a tear for their father was a difficult thing to do. I live in an old Victorian house in a very small town. My seven-year-old son and I were the only ones home one evening. My wife had to work late and my five-year-old daughter was at a friend's house. It was a chilly winter evening and this was before we had satellite TV, so my son was playing with Legos and I was reading a book. My wife always plays this certain game when she comes home from work. When the kids hear the commotion, when she enters the door, they take off running and hide. My wife makes a big deal about looking for them to prolong the fun, then when she finds them she tickles and kisses them. Things turned out differently this evening, though. As she entered the door with the sound of keys jangling and stomping snow from her boots, my son took off running into a small room by the front parlor. 
I was still reading, but I saw a girl in a frilly white dress run past me and follow my son. I thought it was my daughter, maybe having come home with my wife, but the chilling voice that came from the room proved otherwise. Go, Mom! The voice was not that of my daughter. I scrambled out of my chair just as my son bolted out of the room. We both stood there for a moment looking into the dark room as my wife said, Wow, that didn't sound like… She saw the looks on our faces and immediately realized what had happened. I walked into the room. No girl. Nothing. It was absolutely one of the most amazing things I'd ever witnessed, and I was really grateful that she allowed us to see her. We call her Abigail. From a young age, it was clear that there was something strange about Patrick Carney. At 13, his father taught him to slaughter pigs by shooting them behind the ear with a pistol. Carney instantly took a liking to the task and began killing pigs that weren't meant to be slaughtered on his own. It was the blood and the organs he liked so much, and when he thought no one was around, he would kill the pigs so that he could roll around in their intestines. Small and strange, Carney was a target for bullying at school. The bullying left a lasting impact on Carney's personality, and he began fantasizing about killing the people who wronged him. After school, Patrick Carney joined the Air Force. During his time in the military, Carney met David Hill. Though Hill was married, he and Carney began a love affair. After Carney's discharge from the military, the two moved to California. There, Carney and Hill began to argue, frequently. Eventually, Hill left and went back to his wife. Carney, meanwhile, began cruising gay bars in Southern California and Mexico. But what Carney really wanted was something far darker than just casual sex. In 1962, Carney picked up a 19-year-old hitchhiker on his motorcycle. After driving the young man to a secluded spot, Carney shot him behind the ear the same way he had killed the pigs. After his victim was dead, Carney sexually assaulted his body. Carney's next victim was the young man's cousin who had seen Carney pick his victim up on the motorcycle. Carney realized that he could silence a potential witness and indulge his need to kill at the same time. The method was the same. Carney lured his victim to a remote area, shot him in the head, and assaulted his corpse. There was just one more victim that year, another teenage boy that Carney picked up off the street. The next year, Hill left his wife again and returned to Carney. The pair settled into a home in Culver City, California. The next murder wouldn't come until 1967 when Hill and Carney visited one of Hill's friends in Tijuana. Carney couldn't resist the opportunity. He snuck into the man's room and shot him between the eyes with a pistol. He then dragged the body to a bathtub where he assaulted it and then began dismembering it with a knife. He then pulled the bullet out of the man's skull with the knife and buried the body behind the garage before returning to California. There seems to have been something about Carney's relationship with Hill that let him resist his urge to kill. So when Hill left him once again in 1971, Carney began looking for new victims. By now, Patrick Carney had refined his procedure. He began picking up hitchhikers, prostitutes, men from bars, and children as young as eight. Often he would target people who bore some resemblance to the people who had bullied him in school. Once he had them in his car, he would drive with his left hand, making sure to keep to the speed limit to avoid being pulled over. Once he was sure no one could see the car, Carney would shoot the victim in the head with his right hand, leaving the body sitting upright in the seat to look like a passenger. Carney drove to a secluded spot. There, he assaulted the bodies before cutting them up into pieces with a hacksaw. The dismembered parts were then placed in trash bags and dumped in different places around the area, usually freeways. 
but while Carney was careful about disposing of the bodies, he wasn't careful enough. Police were able to draw links between the body parts that began showing up on the side of the freeways and identify the victims. The identity of one of those victims, John LeMay, led police back to Kearney in 1977. Police visiting Kearney's house were then able to gather hair samples that they linked to the trash bags that LeMay's body was dumped in. An arrest warrant was put out for Kearney, and after a brief period on the run, he finally turned himself in. After his arrest, Kearney eventually confessed to 35 murders. If true, then it meant Carney was one of the most prolific serial killers in American history. A psychiatrist who interviewed Carney after his arrest determined he had an IQ of 180, well above what's considered a genius. To put it in perspective, Dr. Manahel Tobit, an economist widely recognized as one of the smartest people alive, only has an IQ of 168. This could explain why Carney was able to get away with so many murders before he was arrested. He knew how to cover his tracks and avoid the police. Due to his cooperation in confessing, Carney was spared the death penalty. Instead, he was given life in prison, where he remains today. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. When Salem Roanoke took a job near his family's new home as a hired hand in the Texas Hill Country, he anticipated learning the rancher's trade, but a series of strange events, shocking murders, and unholy revelations divert him down another path. This terrifying trajectory puts him directly into the middle of a struggle between monsters, magic, and men. Armed and backed by a militia of ranchers, Salem attempts to combat the creeping tide of evil that threatens to engulf his new home and destroy the people most important to him. Will Salem manage to save his home, or have his actions condemn everyone he hopes to save? The Witch Trials – A Summer of Wolves and Season of the Witch by S. R. Roanoke – Available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions. Look for The Witch Trials by S. R. Roanoke on Amazon or find it on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. Historic Mounds Theater a movie theater and entertainment venue on St. Paul, Minnesota's east side, has long been rumored to be haunted. Three ghosts are said to reside there. Red, the theater's longtime projectionist, Jim, who worked on the main floor as an usher, and Mary, a little girl whose apparition often appears on the stage performing for the guests. Since the theater's 2003 reopening, Scores of paranormal investigators have visited the space. Dan Amatrano from the LA-based Northland Paranormal visits on a cool summer evening with hopes of meeting the ghost Red. A local pro wrestling league is here tonight. As athletes prepare, Amatrano walks away from the noise to the projection booth, the perfect spot to measure what paranormal investigators call cold spots. Cold spots are generated by a spirit when it wants to be able to manifest because it's putting all the energy into one particular area, he explains. As the story goes, Red spent much of his life working in the projection booth during the theater's initial run from 1922 to 1967. One legend says he had a crush on a lady moviegoer, which prompted him to jump from the balcony to the aisle to impress her. Instead, he broke his leg. Red died one year after the theater was shut down. 
Chanel Houston, who volunteers at Mounds Theater as a concessionist and tour guide, has developed what she laughingly calls a fun history with Red. His voice is gruff and he swears a lot. He also gropes her on occasion. He likes to touch people, and I tend to be one of the people he touches a lot, she says. Inside the projection booth, Amitrano turns on the EMF meter, which measures electromagnetic activity. A small light on the device turns green. Ghost activity makes the light turn red, he says. Red, I'm going to ask you if you can make this EMF meter go red for me, Amitrano says to the spirit. No pun intended. The meter turns yellow numerous times, but not red. Amatrado says the yellow could indicate ghost communication, but could just as easily signal routine activity like the electricity powering the air vents above. Roughly 90% of the time, Amatrano doesn't find anything. He does these ghost probes as a hobby, free of charge. During this session, the video camera shuts off several times, despite the battery being at 70%. It's unusual, but not enough evidence to convince Amitrano. Other paranormal groups have had better luck. Justin Miner, who works for Johnsdale Paranormal Group, conducted an investigation a few years ago. His strongest piece of evidence came from an EVP device which captures electronic voice phenomenon. Miner had set up Scrabble letters in the woman's bathroom in hopes that an apparition would spell out words. What's going on in here? a male voice says, you're overwhelming me. Miner says this recording is the best EVP voice his group has ever caught. But is that enough to convince him that Mounds Theater is haunted? There is definitely something out of the ordinary going on, he says. As Jesus sank beneath the load, he turned his pitying eye to the unfeeling child of Israel and, pointing up on high, said, Yes, I go for it needs must be, but until I do return, thou must go to and fro. Eugene Sue, 1881. With these words, the sage of the wandering Jew begins its journey. It is said that the story is based on Matthew 16, verse 28, which reads, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. To some, this idea is legitimate. Over the centuries, it has been said that many of the early believers did not see death. Joseph of Arimathea was said to be still alive living in Arimathea in the 13th century AD. Others stated that Jesus' words meant that John the Apostle would stay alive until Christ's return. But no one ever offers any real proof of these claims, or that those men lived beyond their normal years. While it was Eugene Sue who penned the original words, some readers over the centuries felt that it lacked something. Great writers like Goeth, Dumas, and Hans Andersen, to name a few, tried their hands at making this story into a literary masterpiece. They all failed. It was usually the unknown writers who had better luck bringing more drama to the scenario and making it a better read. Most failed because the story lacked drama. It was about a Jew who wandered endlessly. Most attempts to spice up the work failed because they devolved into geography or history lessons. These topics failed to ignite the interest of the general public. Then, the story's main character changed with almost every rendition. Some authors had Ahasuerus as an old man. Others made him out to be a young male. Still others had him age, then was rejuvenated and returned to a young age when he got too old. Finally, some wrote that he died but was reincarnated. Who exactly was this wandering Jew? That was a question all authors failed to identify. The failure to add dramatic situations also doomed all attempts to punch up the story. There are none in the original 
as Ahasuerus was given just two by Mr. Sue. The actual time of the curse and the end of his wandering at Doomsday. It's also said that Ahasuerus made an appearance to the Bishop of Shelswig in 1542. The bishop gave a description of the man he saw in the church. As the men conversed, the bishop was surprised to hear a first-hand account about the sufferings of the original apostles. Over 30 years later, another sighting took place in Spain. Schleswig ambassadors to Spain reported back that they had seen the man the bishop had talked to three decades earlier, except that he spoke perfect Spanish. The different authors who wrote about the wandering Jew, Chaucer to Cervantes, from Rodriguez Lobo to Mark Twain, from Eugene Sue to Frotero and Lucentini, added to the legend and had Ahasuerus embellished to mythical proportions. One example, he was given the ability to speak all earthly languages. It's inevitable that there would be some comparisons here with Cain. Like the wandering Jew who was cursed by Jesus, Cain was cursed by God. Genesis 4.12 says, When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. The only difference between the two curses is that we have record of God's curse on Cain. We do not have any record of Jesus' curse on Ahasuerus. The life of Cain is not really known after he takes his wife and leaves his family. All we know is the name of a few of his descendants and that he built a city. Genesis 4 verses 16 and 17 give us those details. But there is no mention of how long Cain would live in this curse. It can be concluded that he died in old age, but we cannot be sure. Ahasuerus was given a life sentence and said to have been condemned to live until Christ returns. No one knows when that event will take place. If Ahasuerus was a real person, then he should still be alive today and spotted more frequently than just a couple of times in 2,000 years. When examining the story of the wandering Jew, there may be elements that will hold some importance to some groups of Christians. Since it is a work of fiction, not all Christians would agree that the story holds any significance for them. The story may come from Christian traditions, but again, those traditions are not the same for every segment of the faith. One lesson that can be gleaned from the encounter of Ahasuerus with Jesus would be the consequences of sinful actions. Ahasuerus decided to mock and sin against Jesus, whereby he was given an immediate judgment and sentence. But even with that moral lesson, the story does not fit with the nature and character of Jesus, who forgave his tormentors and executioners. Surely they were more eligible for such a curse than a lowly shoemaker who only said a few words to Jesus as he passed by. The curse by Jesus also goes against his teachings found in the Gospels. The legend of the wandering Jew may continue to wander through literature and be expanded, altered, and embellished it's highly likely that most writers will take on the story to see if they can add more moral lessons, drama, and so on. As it stands, it is a legend only, one that does not fit the nature of New Testament thinking or teaching. Depending on where you live, the Crybaby Bridge legend goes something like this. A woman is traveling with her baby or small child when disaster strikes. Perhaps it's a tragic accident that results in mother and child plummeting over the bridge. Perhaps the mother is angry or distraught and hurls her baby into the creek below. Perhaps there's more than one child. Perhaps there's a murderous father. Though multiple versions of the legend exist, they all agree on one thing. A baby dies near a bridge, and its ghostly wails now haunt the tragic sight. At times, the mother's grieving ghost appears in the woods nearby, sobbing and calling out for her lost child. But are these stories true? Probably not. Like many well-known ghost tales, there is little to no evidence to support the tragic backstory. Many of the murders or accidents 
are said to have happened at indeterminate times to unknown people. However, if an event so shocking as a woman throwing her baby off a bridge or a horrific accident had truly happened, there would most certainly be an official record. Yet there are none. That I know of. The lack of evidence and ubiquitous nature of the stories suggests that the Crybaby Bridge accounts are nothing more than urban legends. While the traditional Crybaby Bridge legend lacks historical evidence, there are modern reports of parents throwing their children from bridges. In 2011, a New Jersey man tossed his two-year-old daughter into a creek while she was still strapped to her car seat. In 2015, a father in Florida threw his five-year-old daughter from the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. In 2014, a woman in Oregon hurled her autistic son off a bridge. And of course, there have been tragic bridge accidents involving mother and child. Early last year, a frantic voice led emergency officials to a vehicle partially submerged in the Utah River. When rescuers searched the wreckage, they found an unconscious 18-month-old girl and her deceased mother. The mother had been dead for several hours, so it's not clear who or what called for help. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so bad it's good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching and our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Imagine it's an ordinary day. You're walking down a street that you know very well, and suddenly you feel that something stops you from taking a step forward. There is no visible obstacle standing in your way, and yet you can't move forward. It seems like you've encountered an invisible barrier that simply doesn't allow you to pass. Does it sound strange? In fact, it may sound like an almost impossible scenario, yet there are several cases of people who have reported such encounters. Walking into an invisible barrier? You may never have heard of such a thing, but it is not a modern phenomenon. Peculiar encounters with invisible barriers can be traced to biblical times. Some of the curious reports come from witnesses who have caught glimpses from what can be described as parallel realities. If parallel worlds do exist, and most scientists suggest they do, then it's possible that invisible worlds coexisting next to our own reality may be responsible for the emergence of occasional barriers that are invisible to our naked eye. In more modern times, it has also been suggested that mysterious rays and energy fields are causing the appearance – no pun intended – of invisible barriers. Such energy fields could explain why a perfect engine suddenly dies in the middle of the road. It could also explain why animals and humans are unable to pass beyond a point in the road. In the Bible, Numbers chapter 22, verses 21 through 39, there is a story describing how Balaam, a sorcerer, was summoned by King Balak of the Moabites to curse the Israelites as Moses was leading them toward Canaan. Balaam's donkey refused on three occasions to follow the path, and nothing could force it to walk any further. 
The biblical explanation is that the donkey saw an angel standing in the way and tried to avoid it. Suddenly, the donkey starts to talk and complains about Balaam's treatment. At this point, Balaam is allowed to see the angel of the Lord standing in its path. The angel tells Balaam that the donkey is the only reason the angel did not kill Balaam. It is an interesting account showing there could be entities in our material world that are not always visible to everyone at the same time. Putting the biblical story aside, it should be noted that this strange encounter was just one of many similar that have been recorded throughout history. There are many reports of encounters with time portals and people who have caught glimpses from the past. Such incidents have happened worldwide for as long as anyone can remember. Brief sightings of phantom ancient armies are also not unusual, especially not in the United Kingdom and France where several cases have been reported. One curious incident involving a sighting of a long-gone vanished army and encounter with an invisible barrier took place in 1960 on a road near Otterburn, Northumberland. This place is of great historical importance, and many battles have been fought in the area. One of them was the Battle of Flodden that occurred in September of 1513. The battle has gone into the history books as the largest encounter between England and Scotland. There are several witnesses who say they have seen a phantom army near the site. One of them was taxi driver Dorothy Strong, who reported her car came to a total stop when the phantom army appeared. Suddenly, the engine died, the fare meter went haywire, and the taxi felt as if it was being forced against an invisible wall. The soldiers seemed to close in on us, then fade into thin air, she reported. According to other people, it's not unusual that one can encounter an invisible barrier around that location. A similar incident took place in Saxon, Germany. In 1930, as many as 40 cars stalled simultaneously on one road. None of them were able to restart again for an hour. What could have caused such engine disturbance? There were discussions that secret rays were responsible for these mysterious accidents, but who or what were producing these rays has never been determined. Those who believe in the existence of unseen beings inhabiting our world will find that there are many accounts of invisible barriers associated with fairies. According to an ancient tradition of the stray sod, there was a patch of soil on which fairies have placed a spell. Anyone who steps on this enchanted ground has great difficulty finding his way off it. I was up in the mountains with my dad and my dog for a long weekend. We rented a tiny little scenic cabin made almost entirely of glass the door didn't even lock. Right next to the house, basically the backyard, was a small river. On the other side was a cement dam. It flowed under the small road that was nearby. It was also in a ravine, where there were giant mountains all around, and we were at the bottom. We hung out until nighttime, then went to sleep. Around one in the morning, my dog woke me up because he needed to go outside. It was really cold, so I got all bundled up and put his leash on. I also grabbed a flashlight, because there were absolutely no light sources outside. I went out past the deck into the grass right next to the river and turned my light on. I moved my light all along the edge of the mountain. Suddenly, I saw something on the dam on the other side of the river, and I did a double take. A man was standing on the dam. I guess he was a man. He didn't have a face and was dressed all in black. He wasn't far away at all. We stared at each other for a while. He didn't react at all to my shining the light directly into his eyes, or where his eyes would have been at least. After a minute, I did the stupidest, most horror movie cliché thing ever. 
I called out, Hello? I thought he might have been ice fishing or walking his dog, but when he didn't move or respond, I realized he wasn't doing either of those things. I booked it back inside. I jammed a chair under the door handle, but I knew there wasn't much I could really do since the whole house was made of glass. I woke up my dad. He's legally blind and so it took him forever to get his glasses. Finally, he looked outside. He said he saw the man. I thought I might have been going totally nuts, but he didn't know what to do either. And he went back to bed. Well, I didn't know what to do either and I thought about calling the police, but what would the police do? The man wasn't technically doing anything wrong. He was not on our property or hurting anyone, yet at least, so I couldn't call them. I just watched out the window. He stared straight at me for hours. He actually moved and turned toward my window. After about two hours, he walked back up the hill and down the road. I was so relieved. I thought he was gone. I went to get a glass of water and on the way past the window, there he was, right back on the dam. He stayed there for another hour or so. Then came the part that was truly supernatural. He walked a few feet towards a tree, but never went past it. Instead, one leg and one arm swung forward, then smoothly slid back behind the tree, over and over again. It looked like his pants and jacket had been stuck to the tree and were reacting to strong bursts of wind, but there was no wind to speak of. After that, he disappeared around 5 in the morning. I still don't know what happened or what that was. I thought for a while about it being a slender man, but it doesn't exactly fit the bill. It wasn't tall and skinny enough. There was definitely a supernatural aspect to it, though. In 1921, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle was the highest paid actor in the world. He had recently signed a deal with Paramount Pictures for a whopping $1 million or about $13 million today, an unheard of sum at the time. Posters for his movies billed the 266-pound comedian as worth his weight in laughs. But before the year was out, he was accused of a crime so monstrous that he would never appear on screen again. The conflicting accounts, tabloid exaggerations, and general furor surrounding the crime that ended Arbuckle's acting career make it difficult to determine what exactly happened that fateful day. Even today, publications re-examining the scandal often come to completely different conclusions regarding Arbuckle's guilt or innocence. Virtually, the only indisputable facts seem to be that on September 5, 1921, there was a party at the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco, where alcohol was in abundance, despite prohibition laws, and that both Arbuckle, then age 33, and a woman named Virginia Rapp were in attendance. Then at some point during the revelry, Arbuckle and Rapp were briefly in the same hotel room together. But when Arbuckle left the room, Rapp remained lying on the bed, writhing in pain. Four days later, she was dead of a ruptured bladder. What fueled the scandal at the time, and what has remained a mystery ever since, is just what role, if any, Arbuckle played in Rapp's death. Another partygoer soon accused him of raping and killing her, and he was tried three different times for those crimes. But the first two trials ended with hung juries, and the third ended with an acquittal. Nevertheless, the controversy surrounding his possible guilt and the case as a whole continues on. Virginia Rapp was a 26-year-old aspiring actress and model, originally from Chicago, who had a reputation as something of a party girl. During the party in question, witnesses recalled that an intoxicated Rapp 
complained she could not breathe and then started to tear off her clothes. And this was not the first instance of Virginia Rapp stripping while intoxicated. One newspaper even dubbed her an amateur call girl who used to get drunk at parties and start to tear her clothes off. Rapp's detractors used this as evidence of her wild ways, while her defenders point out that she had a bladder condition that was exacerbated by alcohol and used to cause her such discomfort that she would drunkenly take off her clothes in an attempt to alleviate her condition. And as for the events of September 5, 1921, the accounts of the night vary wildly. According to party guest Maude Delmont, after a few drinks, Arbuckle strong-armed Virginia Rapp into his room with the sinister utterance, I've waited for you five years and now I've got you. After 30 minutes or so, Delmont became concerned upon hearing screams from behind the closed door of Arbuckle's room and started knocking. Arbuckle answered the door wearing his foolish screen smile and Rapp was on the bed, naked and moaning in pain. Delmont claims that Rapp managed to gasp Arbuckle did it before she was taken away into a different hotel room. Arbuckle, however, testified that he had gone into his bathroom and found Rapp already there on the floor, vomiting. After helping her onto the bed, he and several other guests summoned the hotel doctor, who determined that Rapp was just heavily intoxicated and took her into another hotel room to sleep it off. Whatever happened that night, Virginia Rapp's condition had still not improved three days afterward. It was then that she was taken to a hospital where doctors originally thought she had alcohol poisoning from the bootleg liquor. But as it turned out, she had peritonitis, resulting from a ruptured bladder likely caused by her pre-existing condition. The ruptured bladder and peritonitis are what killed her the next day, September 9, 1921. But at the hospital, Delmont told police that Rapp had been raped by Arbuckle at the party, and on September 11, 1921, the comedian was arrested. Newspapers across the country went wild. Some claimed that the overweight Arbuckle had damaged Rapp's liver by crushing her while trying to have sex with her, while others offered up increasingly outrageous stories, consisting of various depravities supposedly carried out by the actor. Both Arbuckle and Rapp's names were dragged through the mud in the competition to print the most salacious rumors. Publishing magnet William Randolph Hearst gleefully noted that the scandal had sold more papers than the sinking of the Lusitania. By the time Arbuckle went to trial for manslaughter, his public reputation was already ruined. Delmont was never actually called to the stand because prosecutors knew her testimony would never hold up in court due to her ever-changing stories. Nicknamed Madam Black, Delmont already had a reputation for procuring girls for Hollywood parties, using those girls to instigate scandalous acts and then blackmailing celebrities anxious to keep those acts quiet. It also didn't help Delmont's credibility that she had sent telegrams to attorneys saying, quote, we have Roscoe Arbuckle in a hole here, chance to make some money out of him, unquote. Meanwhile, although Arbuckle's lawyers showed that the autopsy had concluded that there were no marks of violence on the body, no signs that the girl had been attacked in any way, and various witnesses corroborated the actor's version of events, it took three trials before Arbuckle was acquitted after the first ended with hung juries. But by this time, the scandal had so devastated Arbuckle's career that the jury who acquitted him felt obliged to read an apologetic statement that concluded with, quote, we wish him success and hope that the American people will take the judgment of 14 men and women that Roscoe Arbuckle is entirely innocent and free from all blame, unquote. But it was already too late. Hollywood's highest paid star was now box office poison. His movies were pulled from cinemas, and he never worked on screen again. Arbuckle was able to stay in film by doing some directing, but even behind the camera, 
his career had no chance of finding its footing. He died of a heart attack in 1933 at the age of 46, having never fully restored his reputation. On the morning of January 31, 1921, the Carol A. Deering, a beautiful, huge five-masted schooner, was found hard aground on Hatteras Diamond Shoals, North Carolina. The crew was nowhere to be found. Abandoned and deserted, with all of its eleven crewmen missing, the circumstances are as strange as those of the Mary Celeste and her demise remains as one of the greatest unsolved maritime mysteries of all time. Her sails were up and the galley showed evidence that a meal was about to be prepared. The crew's personal effects were gone, along with the ship's navigational equipment, logbooks, and life rafts. Also mysteriously missing were the eleven crew members of the vessel. Christened Carol A. Deering, the schooner was built in 1919 by the G.G. Deering Company, said to be the oldest active shipbuilder in the country at the time. The Deering was also the last of nearly 100 boats built by the G.G. Deering Company. Described as being a tremendous ship, measuring 255 feet long and 45 feet across, the Deering was designed for cargo service only the best stock was used in constructing this three-deck vessel. Her features included an oak ceiling and planking of hard pine. A handsome combination of mahogany, empress, and ash woods were used to finish the interior. Oregon masts measuring 108 feet long with top masts measuring 46 feet long flanked the vessel. Other luxurious features included a bathroom, with open plumbing and cabins fully lit by electricity and heated by steam. Indeed, she was a wooden boat enthusiast's dream. Mrs. Carol Deering stood at the bow of the ship and christened it using a large bouquet of roses which she scattered as the vessel made its descent down the ways. The Carol A. Deering schooner was being prepared to sail from Boston to Buenos Aires then on to Rio de Janeiro. In charge of the voyage would be part owner and captain William M. Merritt, who chose his son, S. E. Merritt, as his first mate. Nine other Scandinavian men were hired as crew. On August 20, 1920, they set sail for Boston. Later that same month, after sailing from Boston, Captain Merritt became ill and the vessel was diverted to port in Lewes, Delaware. After determining that the captain was too ill to continue the voyage, he was left in Luz. His son, E. E. Merritt, also disembarked the ship to care for his father. Left without a captain and first mate, the Deering Company hastily hired replacements for the positions. Captain Willis T. Warmel, a veteran retired shipmaster and experienced navigator, was chosen as the new captain. He hired Charles B. Malellan as his first mate. On September 8, 1920, the Deering finally got underway for Rio de Janeiro with a cargo of coal. The vessel arrived without incident and the crew was given time off. In the meantime, Captain Warmel met with an old friend, also a captain. Warmel confided in him that he does not like his crew and the behavior of his first mate concerns him. They agree that the ship's engineer, Bates, can be trusted. On their return trip from Rio de Janeiro, a series of events occurred, ultimately ending with the Carol A. Deering running aground. Here is the timeline of events in the final voyage. January 9, 1921, the vessel set sail for Portland, Maine. January 25, another ship, the SS Hewitt, with a crew of 42, disappears from the same area while sailing on a similar course as the Deering. She was last heard from on this date. January 29th, Carol A. Deering reported having passed Cape Lookout Lightship, sailing at 5 miles per hour. 
A man on board got the attention of the passing ship and said the vessel had lost both anchors and asked if he could report it to its owners. The crewman did not act or look like an officer. Shortly after, a passing steamer was asked to stop by the lightship to take the message for the schooner. It is a maritime law to respond to the whistles of the lightship. However, the steamer, whose ship name could not be seen, did not stop and continued sailing on. January 31, 1921. The Carol A. Deering is spotted with all sails set, riding a sandbar at Diamond Shoals. According to the official report, she was driven high up on the shoal in a boiled bed of breakers with all sails set, as if abandoned in a hurry. All personal effects belonging to the crew were gone, along with all of the ship's navigational instruments and the lifeboats. Rescue ships were unable to board the ship due to bad weather, and it was not until February 4th that the ship was boarded. The Coast Guard attempted to salvage the vessel but was unsuccessful. The Carol A. Deering was eventually scuttled with dynamite on March 4th. Despite an extensive investigation by the U.S. government that included the Commerce, Treasury, Justice, Navy, and State Departments, no explanation could be found for the crew's disappearance. There were a number of theories considered by the U.S. government during their investigation that included piracy, mutiny, a hurricane, a Russian or communist piracy, rum runners, or an unexplained paranormal event. The investigation finally wound down and came to an end in 1922, with no official explanation ever being found. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Driving along the isolated road that runs down the scenic Hook Peninsula in Ireland's ancient east, it is easy to spot the mansion that has earned itself the reputation as the most haunted house in Ireland. If ever a building fit the stereotype of a home haunted by its bloody and tragic past, this was it. Set against the backdrop of a rugged and windswept coastal setting, Loftus Hall looms over the surrounding landscape. Its historic walls have seen invasion, capture, plague, famine, and numerous personal tragedies, many of which live on as ghostly legends still told today. The recorded history of Loftus Hall and the land upon which it sits stretches back some 800 years, but locals say the significance of the site goes back thousands of years and was once sacred to the Druids, the high-ranking professional and religious class in ancient Celtic cultures. The story of Loftus Hall begins around 1170 AD when Raymond Redmond Fitzgerald, nicknamed La Grosse or The Fat, landed at Baganbun Head in the Hook Peninsula in what is now the country of Wexford in Ireland. It's a famous site in Irish history known as the place where Ireland was lost and won. 
Raymond was among the first of a small band of Norman knights who played an active role in helping enforce normal rule over Ireland. He acquired land in the area, upon which he built a castle known as Houseland Castle. Over the years, it fell into disrepair, and in 1350, descendants of Raymond Le Gros built a new castle called the Hall of Redmond Hall. The hall remained with the Redmond family until the mid-1600s, when the Irish Confederate Wars saw the castle repeatedly attacked and eventually seized as part of the Cromwellian confiscations. In one remarkable display of defense, on the 20th of July, 1642, Alexander Redmond, who was 68 at the time, managed to protect the hall from around 90 English invaders with just the help of his two sons, some tenants, two soldiers, and a tailor. They staved off several more attacks after which Alexander Redmond received favorable terms from Cromwell. Upon his death around 1651, Redmond's family were evicted from the hall and their home put up for auction. In 1666, Henry Loftus, originally from Yorkshire, England, acquired the confiscated lands and the mansion was renamed Loftus Hall. Over the decades and centuries that followed, the Loftus family rose in the peerage, producing barons, viscounts, earls, and marquesses, and as they climbed the ladder of aristocracy, the illustrious family hoped they could entice Queen Victoria to visit. With that goal in mind, John Henry Loftus, the fourth Marquess of Ely, embarked on an enormous renovation of the hall between 1870 and 1879 to make it grander than ever before. Although it is widely reported that Loftus Hall was completely demolished and rebuilt, there is evidence that much of the former hall was utilized and worked into the mansion that can be seen today. No expense was spared in the renovation of Loftus Hall. Erected as a three-story mansion with a balustraded parapet, the hall boasts an ornate mosaic floor and a spectacular grand staircase hand-carved by Italian craftsmen. The house certainly was fit for a queen. But Queen Victoria never arrived, causing deep disappointment to the Loftus family. While its rich and colorful past is enough to bring history's buffs flocking, it is the legends, the unexplained mysteries, and the tales of ghostly apparitions that have made Loftus Hall one of the most visited mansions in the whole of Ireland. The legends stem from the real life and death of Anne Tottenham. In the mid-1600s, Charles Tottenham married the Honorable Anne Loftus, daughter of the first Viscount Loftus, and they had six children, four boys and two girls, Elizabeth and Anne. But his wife became ill and died while the girls were still young. Two years later, Tottenham married his cousin, Jane Cliff and they lived together along with Anne in Loftus Hall. One night, amid a powerful storm, a ship arrived at the Hook Peninsula and a young man made his way to Loftus Hall, asking if he could take shelter there. It was not uncommon for strangers to come knocking, as the rough waters around the South Wexford coast often resulted in ships being grounded on the shore or shattered by rocks. The man was invited in, and ended up residing at the house for several weeks. During this time, Anne, now a young woman, fell in love with the stranger and spent countless hours socializing with him in the tapestry room. According to local legends, one evening Anne was playing cards with the stranger as well as other guests when she leaned down under the table to collect a card she had dropped and noticed that the stranger had cloven hoofs. She screamed loudly, causing the stranger to expose himself as the devil. He transformed into a ball of fire and shot up through the roof, leaving Anne in a state of trauma from which she never recovered. Anne's mental state deteriorated rapidly, and her family, embarrassed by her behavior, confined her to a room in the house where she remained until her death in around 1775. It is said that from this time onwards, Loftus Hall became plagued by severe poltergeist activity, the troubled Anne never able to rest in peace. 
several Protestant clergymen were summoned by the family to put a stop to it, but none could rid the house of its evil forces. In their desperation, the family, themselves Protestant, called upon a Catholic priest who was a tenant on their estate, Father Thomas Broders, who was successful in cleansing the house of negative forces. It is popularly reported that his gravestone contains the inscription, Here lies the body of Thomas Broders, who did good and prayed for all and who banished the devil from Loftus Hall, though there is no evidence that this inscription ever existed. It is fair to say that many of the details of this account are likely to be little more than fictional folktales. Nevertheless, reports going back over a century say that Anne was indeed confined to a room in Loftus Hall until her death. So what really happened to her? It is most likely that the account of the cloven hoof and the devil shooting through the roof was made up by the Loftus family to deter beggars and other strangers from paying a visit to the hall. After all, they were desperately hoping to entice Queen Victoria for a visit, so the last thing they needed was undesirables getting in the way. This then raises the question as to whether Anne really was confined due to mental illness, or whether there was another reason for this tragic ending to her life. According to one alternative account, the stranger had fallen in love with Anne and had asked Charles Tottenham for her hand in marriage, but was refused permission. He was turned away from the house, leaving Anne heartbroken. But there is another twist in this story. During the restoration of Loftus Hall, the skeletal remains of a tiny infant were found between the walls in what is believed to have been the room Anne had been locked in. Did Anne fall pregnant with the stranger, casting shame upon her family? This could have provided a motive for her father to lock her away, never to be seen again. One local account suggests that Anne died during childbirth after her father refused to let anyone know of her pregnancy, including the local doctor, and she suffered complications leading to her death. Today, Anne Tottenham's grave is located in a local graveyard in Wexford, but something is very peculiar about it. Unlike the surrounding graves, it is completely cemented over. The people that buried her clearly wanted to ensure no one could ever access her body. What dark secrets did Anne take with her to the grave? Metaphorically, Loftus Hall is indeed haunted by its dark and troubled history. One can almost feel the sadness and traumas that have taken place within its walls. But does the ghost of Anne still roam the cold and empty rooms of the mansion as it stands today? Many are convinced the answer is yes. Indeed, American ghost hunters carried out detailed investigations of the house and claimed to have detected numerous anomalies. But it was in 2014 that Loftus Hall cemented its reputation as the most haunted house in Ireland when a visitor taking a tour believed that he captured a haunting image on his camera. It subsequently went viral, attracting the attention of people all around the world. 21-year-old Thomas Beavis said he was browsing through the photos on his camera when he noticed the ghostly figures of a young woman and an older woman in a window. In the early 20th century, the Loftus family went bankrupt and following the death of the last member of the Loftus family, it was taken over by the Benedictines, who occupied it until 1935. In 1937, the Sisters of Providence converted it into a convent and school for young girls wanting to join the order. Locals say that people were terrified to attend Mass in its chapel, giving the well-circulated legends of the devil himself visiting the hall. In 1983, Loftus Hall was purchased by Michael Duvereau, who opened it as Loftus Hall Hotel. Michael died in the hall, and his wife struggled for several years trying to run the hotel on her own, until one night she took off without any explanation, leaving everything behind. Loftus Hall then entered another dark period. The property was left vacant but was occupied illicitly for nearly a decade 
by people conducting satanic rituals and meetings. In 2011, it was purchased by its current owners, the Quigley family, who have embarked on an ambitious project of restoration. Today, Loftus Hall is open to the public, who can join a 45-minute guided tour that showcases the history of the hall and its many legends. Leaving the hall after one of these tours, one is left with more questions than answers. Fact and fiction have become so closely entwined in the history of Loftus Hall that it is impossible to determine where history ends and the legend begins. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.